Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, we're going to continue our discussion about fire and explosives. We'll finish, try and finish fire portion today. And then we'll talk about explosions on Monday. Um, in fact, of course, they're very much linked. Um, but you'll see that there's, there are some distinct differences between the two when we talk about it. This is where I finished off last time. And it's with this picture of this little house that's been, it's been burned down. And um, a fire investigator coming here will immediately spot that there is this V-shaped burn pattern here. And uh, very likely at the base here is the point of origin of the fire. The fire has then moved inside. Um, it has moved upstairs by, by convection and simply by burning through the floors or whatever. Um, but it is this part here which is of particular interest. And um, I will tell you uh, that a fire investigator arriving here will not immediately assume that this is arson. Uh, can you think, look at where this is pointing, and can you think? Um, of a likely reason why this fire might have started. I'm not saying that it is the way it started. I'm just suggesting to you. There's one very obvious thing. What often sits here in a place like this, in a out, outside of a house? A trash can, a trash can. And trash cans are notorious, absolutely notorious for starting fires. Not only uh, do people accidentally throw stuff in them that is smoldering or whatever, which can catch fire, throw a cigarette end in or whatever, but also there are some combinations of uh, ordinary household chemicals and things um, which can spontaneously combust, either on their own or uh, under certain circumstances or mixed with other uh, household chemicals, they can actually lead to a fire. And a, a fire investigator would not immediately assume that a fire situated like this had arisen from arson. It could have, but um, it could also be completely accidental. Okay, so um, the one thing we, I, we need to really understand um, about, especially about house fires, they can proceed incredibly fast, very, 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 very rapidly from a small beginning. Um, if you remember that, that movie, Point of Origin, um, on several occasions there, um, it pointed out to you that within, almost within seconds of, a, of the first small flame being observed or small amount of smoke being observed, the fire just exploded really rapidly, so rapidly that it in fact could trap people. And this very frequently happens, unfortunately. Um, especially in an enclosed space, as soon as you start uh, burning a fire, that's the fire, the flame is relatively enclosed. Radiation of heat begins to heat things up around it and pyrolysis begins to occur. Pyrolysis can occur for all many, many, many different substances. Uh, virtually anything that has an organic basis, the plastics, wood, whatever, all of these can be pyrolyzed. And one of the very dangerous aspects of this pyrolysis and of the initial fire is that the the burning is inefficient and it produces dense smoke. Now, black smoke in particular is extremely dangerous because it's very, very rich in carbon compounds. And those carbon compounds are being heated and heated and heated by the prevailing flames, by radiation from the fire that exists already. This can proceed until such a point that the, the carbon particles in the smoke actually ignite and they explode. In addition to that, the, in an enclosed space like that, the radiation of heat can be so great that it can begin to pyrolyze uh, objects very far away from the actual flame itself. 
and these this can continue until such time as ignition point is reached and then the whole room all of the objects in the room will suddenly burst in flame altogether together with the smoke and everything else and this is a, a catastrophic situation called flashover and it is the dread of all all firefighters that they be caught in a situation of flash over like this. So I'm going to show you um, a little movie. I hope this works. I don't think there'll be any sound. I think that's usually the problem. Um, uh, if there's any problem, you can watch it on your own. The link is there in the PowerPoint presentations. Will it's very short. I'll and I'll just talk you through um, through what they. Oh, it's not working. Oh well. No, it won't work for me. All right, but please have a look at that. The, this very short movie, it's like five minutes or so. And what it shows is, it's a, an artificial setup, a training setup for firefighters, where they've actually built a room. And it's an ordinary lounge uh, with lounge furniture. And in the corner, there is a waste paper basket. And in, they put paper in the waste paper basket and they set it alight. And initially, uh, there's just a flame at the, at the waste paper basket. Then the fire really gets going in the waste paper basket. And you begin to see objects close to the waste paper basket, like the couch, begin to actually smoke. They're beginning to pyrolyze as radiant heat heats them up. At the same time, as oxygen begins to be used up a bit, the fire gets a little bit inefficient like in the waste paper basket and everything, and it begins to produce black smoke. Of course, the smoke rises because the heat that is convected up to the ceiling. The smoke begins to build over the, the ceiling. And it's sort of a roiling cloud of black. As soon as you see that black, you know that you're looking at carbon-rich compounds. They are being heated. They are being superheated. At the same time, objects around the waste paper basket begin to flame as they reach their ignition point. Then they begin to radiate heat out and everything in the room starts to heat up. And then the smoke in the, at the ceiling catches fire. And at the same time, there's flash over and everything in the room bursts into flame. And from start, from the very start of the fire, in the waste paper basket to complete flash over. Nobody would survive inside that room is less than five minutes. And in fact, you can see that the, the, the situation is already catastrophic within a minute or two of the fire starting. Now that f little film is actually um, a public service. It was released as a public service announcement because people often imagine um, when they think about a fire in their own home, well, they think, well, this will never happen anyway. Um, but they think, well, if there's a fire, you know, I'll have time to get out. I'll have time to do this. I'll have time to pick up the papers or the pets or whatever and make my way out. This demonstrates, that little movie uh, demonstrates to you that that option is very often not present because it takes so little time for a fire to become catastrophically large that you can imagine, imagine people are upstairs in a home and the fire starts downstairs and nobody knows that it started or only notice after five minutes or something that something is happening. By that time, the fire may have reached catastrophic levels. This is also one of the reasons why arson is very frequently fatal. And while arsonists often have no intention of killing people, they imagine that if they start a fire, everybody will have time to get away, and they don't. Fire can move extremely rapidly. And one of the reasons for that is it generates a huge amount of heat, and that heat is not localized. That heat is radiated to objects which are far away. The heat is carried by objects far from the source of the heat to such a point that they eventually reach their own ignition point and burst into flames, even if 
they aren't touched by flame itself. So it, this also makes um, uh, it very difficult to investigate uh, a, a scene where a flashover has occurred because all of the objects in the room may have burst into flames, may have just ignited at pretty much the same time. And it may be very difficult to identify the point of origin. That is one of the reasons why burn marks are remaining burn marks and the extent of burning is assessed. So that some, an area which has burned longer uh, may well be closer to the, sea, the origin of the fire. A burn pattern left on a wall may well be the burn pattern left by the fire's origin. Um, in addition, as we've said before, arsonists very frequently use an accelerant of some sort. And uh, they, if they do so, they often will splash the accelerant irregularly um, all over the place. And this leaves characteristic irregular burn patterns, which as we said before, are often linked to one another by streamers, which are left as almost functioning like fuses going from one pool of accelerant to another, one place of accelerant to another. So the, the, the first thing a fire investigator may do at the scene is to start photographing, photographing those kinds of patterns. The second thing is to make sure that samples are carefully collected or any place where accelerant may have been used. So um, the, these are all things that, that a, a fire investigator would point, would immediately make a, a fire investigator believe that arson had occurred. The patterns of burn on the floor, irregular patterns of burning. Um, excessive burning, burning, uh, by, by that I mean, um, uh, burning which appears to be have occurred at a much higher temperature than normal from normal spread of a fire um, is often due to the presence of an accelerant. Um, the, once a, an investigator has a clue that this may be arson, they will look very, very carefully for the presence of some sort of an igniter. Even a match, even the remains of a match would be carefully photographed and then preserved as potential evidence. An arsonist very frequently um, will set up a scene for fire, pour accelerant or do whatever, and then set the fire in such a way that they can get away, both for safety of person, so they don't get burned, but also so they can be distanced from the scene when it is actually noticed that something is, is happening. And for this reason, they will often make use of some sort of an igniter with a delay on it. And um, these, this can be as simple as putting a lighting a cigarette and dropping it into a, 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 into a waste paper basket or something like that. Um, but they all sorts of um, ingenious, firing devices have been found, modified firearms and ammunition, all sorts of things. Um, there is also uh, quite often they will make use of something like a Molotov cocktail. A Molotov cocktail is a bottle filled with fluid with a top with um, a wick in it. The wick is lit. The bottle doesn't explode in your hand when you light the wick for the simple reason there's no, there's no oxygen inside the bottle for the gas, for the accelerant to, to burn. And the bottle is then thrown, smashes and spills accelerant everywhere, which explodes. So uh, the simplest uh, kind of contrived delay device is one which you saw described in that movie, The Point of Origin. And this is a cigarette with matches around it with an elastic band or whatever, and the cigarette is lit and then it's dropped. 
the cigarettes burns down and then sets the matches alight. Well, that now is rather difficult to do because um, cigarette manufacturers now, knowing the importance of cigarettes in fire, not, a, not necessarily arson, but cigarettes in general can, are very dangerous objects. They can cause a fire very easily. And cigarettes, most cigarettes now are modified so that the paper doesn't burn. Um, it doesn't burn unless you draw on it. And as a result, if the cigarette is dropped, it stops burning at a certain point. So uh, these uh, delay devices now most, most commonly will not work unless they get cheap cigarettes from somewhere um, that burn a little bit more uh, dangerously. Um, so here's a, another thing. In investigating a fire, uh, a fire investigator may ask some very strange questions and they may look for some very particular things. And it's not things that, were, that might be obvious to us. But let's just say somebody wants to plan burning down their house for insurance purposes, right? So this requires some considerable planning especially if the person wants to burn this house down in such a way that a fire investigator is not going to pick up on the fact that the, the um, uh, that it's an artificial situation. And uh, so, but the person who's planning to burn their house down, what are they going to do? Are they going to leave their pets inside the house? Are they going to leave objects of sentimental value or of real value? Are they going to leave their jewelry there to melt? Um, no. If for the most, in most cases, no. Somebody planning an arson of their own property will often remove from the property items which are of importance to them so that they are not damaged, hoping that nobody will notice that they're not present in the house. But a clever fire investigator will notice things like that. They will notice that the pets are safe and that the, the pet carriers aren't present in the house. They will notice that um, the owner of the house is uh, wearing a lot of jewelry, but there's no jewelry in the cupboards in the bedroom. Things like this are pointers to the fact that this may not be uh, quite hunky-dory. In addition, a fire investigator may go even further. They may go ask to see insurance papers, for example. They may interview insurance agents and find out, have there been any major changes in insurance policies? And they may also inquire as to whether there are any changes in the life style of the person concerned. Are there pressures on this person? Are they up for fraud somewhere? Are they engaged in a divorce? All of these things may be, may point to the fact that a fire was advantageous to somebody and may, uh, may induce the, uh, the fire investigator to actually look a bit further than just what they see in front of their eyes. So, hold on. Um, so, all right. So we've we've already seen there can be patterns, especially um, left in the, the pattern of flame, the pattern of movement of flame. Um, but uh, unfortunately, especially in a vigorous fire, a lot of the of the evidence is simply going to be destroyed. Uh, houses very often collapse completely um, in, during fire, especially wood frame houses. Um, they also, uh, in, a, in a building itself, fire can move in very strange patterns. It, was, it is following both fuel and oxygen. And those fuel and those oxygen patterns especially may not be immediately apparent. And the, the fire may move in very strange ways, which may look like arson when it's not. So it takes considerable skill for the fire investigator to actually determine 
uh, whether it's whether it is fire, uh, arson or not. There is another aspect to a fire scene or an explosion scene, um, which we don't immediately think of. And that is that a tremendous amount of evidence can be destroyed by the efforts to quell the fire because water is extremely damaging and a fire um, will, uh, in fighting a fire, firefighters use a tremendous amount of water, a huge, huge, huge amount of water, which has then been poured over a crime scene. But there is one thing if in our, at arson scenes, there is one thing which uh, stands in, the, in the, uh, the fire investigator's favor, and that is that most arsonists use an accelerant of some sort. Um, it is very, very common. And it is very uncommon for all of that accelerant to be consumed by the fire. It can be, um, but it's very unusual. You can usually find some trace of the, the accelerant. Even if it's micro, even if it's to the molecular level, the reason for that is that the accelerants um, soak into surfaces very, very easily. And once the fire starts, part of the accelerant is soaked in is isolated from uh, from the oxygen source and does not burn very easily. It can eventually burn, but often it is not. And this is one instance where the firefighters using water works in the fire investigator's favor because water flooding over a surface with flammable fluids embedded in it actually preserves those fluids. It stops them from evaporating. Um, uh, there are mechanical uh, accelerant detectors which can be used um, to try and uh, sniff out uh, hydrocarbons uh, at higher scene, but there's a very, very good biological mechanism, and that is to use a dog. A dog is specially trained to recognize the smell of accelerants, will recognize accelerants where they're, they're in fantastically low concentration on a surface, and will give an indication that, that accelerant is there. If there's any accelerant there, it is very, very possible that it can be revealed by laboratory methods and can be analyzed by laboratory methods. So first it's got to be collected. This is the standard way of collecting evidence at a fire scene. Um, and uh, often a substantial amount of ash, soot, uh, crumbled surfaces, carpeting, whatever may be collected. Um, and it's anything which might contain accelerant, especially from those burn patterns and from streamers, places like that. And they are placed in metal canisters like this, which are airtight. And these canisters now, once they've got all the stuff in it, of course, this is all placed into the chain of evidence. Um, these do not necessarily have to be opened again. Um, because the, they have a rubber port in them here that an injection syringe can be in, stuck into so that the head space, the gases inside the can, can be sampled and then put through an analysis. Um, so that, that's the standard way of collecting the materials. Um, sometimes uh, uh, it's very important always to um, have control specimens. You don't want to collect, for example, um, materials uh, which release, va release vapors, say, for example, um, plastics and things like this um, may give off gases just spontaneously, um, even if they, they don't have accelerant on. So you need to compare your or something similar to the contaminated surface, you need to compare a contaminated sample to uncontaminated. It's your standard thing. You've got a standard and a question sample that you are comparing to show the difference. And that we call a substrate control. Um, the 
there's another thing, and that is um, there are many substances which we use as well in households, which will mimic an accelerant. And uh, even if you've spilled things like lighter fluid or thing, something accidentally, it might be picked up, especially if you bring in a dog or a sniffer of some sort, it might pick up something which is actually quite innocuous, a, a coincidental innocuous occurrence. Uh, so that always has to be borne in mind. Um, any presence of anything that looks like an, an igniter, that would set off alarm bells. And if a suspect is um, apprehended, especially if they're apprehended very soon, their clothing should immediately be taken. And um, again, it is treated as if um, it might contain uh, an accelerant and even trace amounts of accelerant can be picked up from, from clothing, from shoes, etc. So the main way of identifying these accelerants is to use a, a method called gas chromatography. And I'm only going to describe it in the broadest possible terms. We, we don't have to worry over much about all the detail. But gas chromatography, um, works especially well on substances which vaporize easily or on gases. And uh, the, that obviously means that these accelerants which vaporize extremely easily are very good contenders for identification by gas chromatography. And uh, the gas chromatograph emerges as a sort of a fingerprint and what it is doing is actually measuring the molecular size of the molecules involved. Most accelerants are a mixture actually of different kinds of molecules. And very often they um, lie within a, a certain range of molecular size of one another. I'll show you in a second. With the gas chromatograph produces a kind of fingerprint. The gas is sampled through that port can, without opening. And in actual fact, even very, very small trace amounts of gas, of, I'm sorry, accelerant on a porous surface stored in a can like this will produce sufficient uh, vapor for an analysis to be done. It's a very, very sensitive technique. Um, often what they will do is they will gently heat those cans to encourage vaporization of accelerant from the substances from the substances inside. And um, the, um, that is then injected into straight into a gas chromatograph. So I'll just, uh, okay, here's uh, another thing which we can do. Um, uh, there, this is all um, rubbish and tr rubble and whatever that has been collected debris from the fire scene. And um, one of the other things that can be done is we can actually concentrate vapor in a small strip of charcoal, of activated charcoal, soaked or uh, coated strip hung in a vessel like this that is then heated. And this it traps vapors, and this can be then removed uh, for analysis. You can wash it with solvents and then evaporate that and use that in a gas chromatograph as well. Okay, so the way a gas chromatograph works, is first of all, uh, we need to realize that the accelerants consist of molecules of, col of carbon um, atoms all joined together. And um, accelerants differ from one another in the length of those carbon molecules. And uh, sometimes very, very short, just a few carbons joined together. In, where there's one uh, instance of something that burns very easily where there's just one carbon molecule, and that's gas, household gas, that's CH4, and it has one carbon molecule. Obviously, you're not going to use that as an accelerant. The liquid accelerants have longer molecules of carbon, but they may still be quite short. So here, for example, 
just as an example, the here is a, a, this is called light petroleum distillate for a very good reason. It has a very, very low density. And the reason for that is that most of its molecules are very small, between six and eight carbons in length. That's very short, but long enough for it to be liquid. So the way in which a gas chromatograph works is it consists of um, a tube called a column with a substance in it, which can retard molecules as they pass by. And it has a special property. It can retard gas molecules, vapor molecules. And uh, so the uh, sample that you take from the, one of those cans is diluted with uh, a gas, which is called a carrier gas. It's usually something inert, like nitrogen, something like that. And that flows into the gas chromatograph and it flows through this tube. And the tube retards molecules by molecular size. It is extremely sensitive. It is sensitive to a one atom difference between a six carbon molecule and a seven carbon molecule. The seven carbon molecule would be retarded more than the six carbon molecule. And um, it, then there is a sensor at the end of, of the column that marks the passage of these different gases by size as they emerge. And uh, here's, here's the typical uh, pattern. Um, and this particular distillate here, you can see, um, it has, there's the first peak, second peak, third peak, fourth peak, and a fifth peak here. And these uh, correspond roughly to uh, six carbon, um, then around the seven there, there's um, a bit of differences because uh, carbons can have double molecules, double bonds and single bonds, et cetera. Um, and then out here is the, um, the largest of all of them. And uh, you can see the range here from total range from six to eight, but our major peaks are these ones here, one, two, three, four, five. And it's a kind of a fingerprint of that accelerant. And it is what we'll find is that these uh, accelerants are commercially produced. And the manufacturers keep a rec very careful record of the way in which they are manufactured. They know exactly what the composition of them are, is there are thousands and thousands and thousands of them. But there is a repository, a database, of these, of these fingerprints, of these chromatograms that you can send your chromatogram off to, to try and get a, an ident a firm identification. And it can tell you not only the molecules that are present, but it will tell you, it can tell you an actual manufacturer, the, the, uh, some source that manufactures that particular liquid um, that could be used as an accelerant. So this is one which is a very light distillate. Uh, here is medium petroleum distillate with three major peaks and then all of these intervening peaks here. Um, and you can see it's got, they've by and large got far more carbon molecules between nine and nine and 11. So uh, here's heavy petroleum distillate getting up now more to the oily kind of distillate. And this, this in fact, um, would, I, th I think would probably be a diesel or something, something like that. So uh, these, this means that we can actually look at these and say exactly what compounds are present, exactly what the size of the molecules are. And hopefully by looking at this fingerprint, it can be identified to a manufacturer. And that may give us very important information because different, for example, different service stations get their, get their gasoline from different sources. And those different sources may have very different compositions. And if you have, um, uh, you identify a particular uh, accelerant and it is only sold at one or two gas stations in the area, 
it might be worthwhile going to those, identifying those gas stations and going and looking at their video surveillance to see who has recently bought and filled cans um, of gasoline to take with them. Um, as you, by the way, here is the, the actual uh, hydro, reference hydrocarbon um, uh, database if you want to go there and have a look at that. Um, it's, and it's very, very, it's big, actually very, very extensive uh, database. Okay, so um, a little bit short, but we had a long class earlier in the week, so um, uh, I'm going to stop there so that we can cover explosions. We can start with explosions on Monday. Okay, we have, uh, by my reckoning, we have one, two, three, four, I think five more classes to go. So we're doing well. Okay, and I'll see you then on Monday. Hello.